Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another AW Author Chat. I'm Lisa White, Associate Manager Marketing and Publicity at Albert Whitman and Company. I'm so excited to sit down and chat today with Carol Kim, whose new picture book, King Sejong and Vincent Alphabet, just published with us on October 1st. Thanks so much for joining me, Carol. Thank you, Lisa. I am very honored to be here and uh, to talk about King Sejong. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here. Now, first off, would you like to kind of introduce yourself a little bit more and tell us what your book is about? Sure. So um, I'm Carol Kim. I am a date. This is my debut um, picture book, King Sejong and Vincent Alphabet, illustrated by Cindy Kang. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have, um, this is my first trade publication. I have written several books for the educational market, um, mostly nonfiction, but I have written some fiction chapter books. Um, and, uh, but my, my love is kind of uh, nonfiction. And um, so this book is kind of the, the, uh, the title explains it pretty well. <laughs> uh, King Sejong was um, king of Korea in 15th century Korea. And he, um, and at that time, uh, only the privileged, like upper classes, the aristocracy had access to education um, and to learning. And so most people couldn't read or write. And it was also uh, harder because Korea didn't have an alphabet. They, they used um, Chinese characters um, called Hanja, but um, the Chinese, characters and the Korean alphabet, they, I mean, and the Korean language are not, you know, for people who aren't familiar with these countries' languages, you might think like, oh, you yeah, know, it's probably a good match, but actually it isn't. They're very different languages. Their um, base of the language is very different. And so Sejong sort of described it as trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And so he decided that um, Korea needed an alphabet. And so he decided to, to make one. And um, the interesting thing was that he understood that this was something that was going to meet with a lot of resistance from the people you know, in power. And so he had to do it in secret. And um, he, he worked on it. You know, and I say he, like it's, it was, he definitely was involved in it. Um, there probably were people helping him, but for the purposes of this discussion, we'll just say that it was King Sejong. It always takes a um, bit. Took, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, you know, like, uh, like he probably didn't do it just all by himself, but um, he is definitely due the credit for it. And it took about ten years for him to come up with it. And um, and then when he finished, he released it into the world. And predictably, the people in other like government officials and they they resisted it. They tried to suppress it and they protested against it. Um, Sejong, of course, was king, and so he could do what he wanted. So he released a lot of things using Hangul to try and get it out into the world. Uh, but he only lived for another four years after Hangul was released in 1443. So anyway, I, I should know that date. <laughs> I'm the but, worst. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of like, some, so suddenly it kind of like flew out of my head. But um, after his death, then basically Hangul lost its champion. And so uh, the alphabet kind of went through hundreds of years of this roller coaster of it sometimes being in favor, sometimes being suppressed um, until after the end of World War II. Um, when, and then that was also marked the end of the Japanese occupation of Korea then the Korean government made Hangul the official alphabet in 1946. So that's, that's the story of Hangul. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing that it is in our modern times that this, um, this alphabet finally became official. Yeah, definitely. And I, you know, one thing I really love about the story is this is a great example of someone using their power for good and using it to make like a really great impactful difference that helps a lot of people, even if it's something that may not be the most popular thing to do with certain people, you know, it's still trying to, to really help people that are struggling and need, need help. Like you said, you know, it wasn't accessible to people that didn't have a certain level of being able to 
learn a certain language and a lot of that has to do with like money and access. So I love that story of accessibility and trying to, you know, you know, get education and literacy for all that he really helped champion. Yeah, exactly. So what inspired you to write about King Sejong and about your book? Um, well, so I have my, you know, I'm one of those people with the long journey to become a children's writer. I wanted to do it since I was a kid. I used to write stories and poetry and that kind of thing. And then what happens to many of us, like you get a little older, you start to become self-conscious about it. And you start thinking like, oh, well, that's like, you know, this thing that like, that, like people don't actually do that and you don't actually do that for a living. And, um, but also I, um, I became uncomfortable with the idea of sharing stories. And I, I talk about that a lot now um, on my, about my journey as an author, like it's very vulnerable <laughs> to share stories that you have written like in this way. And so um, when I tried to do any writing, like by the time I was in high school and in college, and then I would read it, I think like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Like I, like, I have no talent, I'm not a writer. And um, I- Just um, think if most writers, if you don't feel that way, I'd be surprised because most writers do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, th I think that's true. And if you don't, there's probably, you probably need to be a little more, you know, reflective. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I basically stopped writing um, any kind of creative writing uh, for like decades. And then um, I have come to believe that if you have, like you hold this dream in your heart, and I think most of us, us do, like from the time that we're children, like that dream is there for a reason and you should probably stop pushing it away, which is like basically what I tried to do for, you know, as I said, decades, um, but it's always there. Like you can't actually kill it. <laughs> and so when I had kids of my own, then this whole thing about wanting to write for kids, it came all back because there I was exposed again to the world of children's books. And, um, and so I thought about what kind of books I would like to have seen, like would have liked to see for my kids, um, for like, I wish that were available when I was a kid. And so then I started, I kept coming back to stories about Korean culture because there aren't that many, you know, there are more now, of course, but there really weren't any um, at that time. And so um, I, you know, I did have other stories, ideas, but I just kept coming back to this idea of um, themes around Korea history and culture. Um, and so by the time I reached the point of actually thinking about writing children's books, I kind of feel like the timing also was working out. Um, it was like the, the, it was just this period of time when, you know, like there was more of an interest in um, diverse books and um, it was just, it kind of felt like uh, even though I could look back and say, boy, I wish I had you know, gotten the courage to do this earlier. I, on the other hand, like when it happened, it was kind of the right time for me, you know, and for these stories. So um, I decided it was really just a few years ago when I really, you know, I had been doing the educational publishing for like a year or so. And it was and that gave me some confidence as a writer. It was kind of like, okay, like I actually can do this. Um, and so I started looking for ways that I could help myself. And that was, I got a mentorship. I, I won a mentorship with Katie House for which I'm super grateful. <laughs> um, I took the course, a writing course at the Children's Book Academy. And um, I got really involved with the Austin chapter of SCBWI. And so I really, was like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go all in on this. And um, that's when, like when the idea for the Korean alphabet came to me, it was like all these things came together. And, um, and I was finally ready to try to write it and get it published. Um, and then the market, I felt like it's also open to it at the time. I really love that because it's also, you know, kind of like King Sejong, you know, you really cultivated something, but you kept up with your dream and kind of worked towards it. And I think that's a lovely message for people. Like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, when you do it, you don't have to do your dream right away. But, you know, if you keep at it and you find it again in life and, and then you follow it and stick with it, it can become this great, great journey. Yes.
Yeah. Now, how did you discover King Sejong and uh, decide to choose that as the topic for your book? Um, so, so my parents uh, immigrated from South Korea, like in the 1950s. And so they were some of the earliest um, Koreans to come to the United States. And um, my mother went back to visit her family a few times um, over the years, but my father never went, never, ever. <laughs> and all the time, his family was here. They were in California, which is where we lived. And so um, after my mother passed away, my dad said to me, I want to go to Korea. And so it was like, all right, let's do it. And so he took me and my family and my oldest brother and his family. This was in 2014. And so um, when we were sort of talking about it, it, this conversation happened to come up. You know, my dad does not, he's not, he's a man of few words. He doesn't talk a lot. He just, and he never really would talk about Korea. Like I would try to ask him questions and he would get really tired of talking about it pretty quickly. He was like, you can ask me about that later. I'm like, dad, like, dude, I'm running out of time here. But for some reason he happened, it was, it was related to our trip. And um, he kind of was saying like, yeah, my, um, my reading and writing level of Korean is like a third grade level. And I was like, what do you mean? Because like, here's my dad, he's, a, he's an educated person. He's gone, you know, college and he reads all the time. And so he started telling me about Hangul and he said, well, it didn't actually become the alphabet until 1946. But at that, you know, at that, that point in time, of course, my father was an, a young adult. Yeah. And, and so then finally I'm understanding, like he grew up, of course, when he lived in Korea, it was during the Japanese occupation. And so he really didn't live in Korea when um, like all his education and everything was in Japanese. And so when Hangul finally came around, he was already 18. Yeah. And so um, he just explained you know, the history of it and he explained about King Sejong and how like how like there was all this resistance to it and that's why it didn't become the official alphabet for so long. And I was like, I was like, how have I never heard this story? Like this is an incredible story. And it's like, and I know like lots of other people haven't heard this story. You know, even you know like Korean Americans, I'm a second generation, but I thought like this like people need to hear this and this would make a great children's book. <laughs> Like that's really the thought I had. And this was 2014, keep in mind, when I wasn't quite there yet. So I just carried this idea with me. And then when we went to Korea, I did, I was kind of looking around and I um I picked up this, we went to this museum and they had these um books. This was then this one happened to be about Sejong. Of course, they love King Sejong in Korea. He's a god. Um and, um, and it's in English, it's all in English and it talks about him. And I thought, you know, so I, I took that home for me and that um, really became kind of the foundation for, um, for me writing the story. That's such a neat story. Cause I think, you know, it's a really teachable thing for kids like to kind of try to imagine growing up learning, you know, English and then all of a sudden, you know, being 18 you have to change to a different language. Like, you know, a language that's not even, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Korean and Japanese, they aren't even the same, like, mother language, like, where, you know, with Latin, you know, there's some, like, right. overlap with words. I, like, I don't think there's any overlap really at all. So you have to learn a whole new alphabet, a whole new pronunciation, everything. It's, that's so, that's such a, you know, a concept that I think a lot of kids would find interesting and not even know that that's something that people had to experience, like, in Korea. Yeah, right. And then, like, kind of, like, modern times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, was there something unique or memorable that you learned about from writing this book uh, or anything really surprising? Well, um, the thing is, King Sejong is this really interesting person. Um, it, I mean, the whole story of Hangul, of course, is fascinating. And the fact that a king invented it is really interesting. Um, and, and so, it, what was hard for me when I was writing the story was there's all this stuff that I wanted to include because because Sejong himself was so interesting. He was kind of this Renaissance man. Um, he was basically always looking for ways to improve people's lives. Um, and that was really, you know, he was unusual in that way. Like 
particularly during that time, you know, in the 15th century, like if you're a king, like you just care about your king. Like being Monarchies king, are not known to usually know, care about everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it has right, the little people, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because they, they don't and they don't have to. Like there's like, you know, like it's just, but this sort of for him, um, that was something that he he believed was really important. Um, and so, and he also was like this person who was, who was very much interested in learning and promoting learning. And so he is credited with all of these inventions. Like he has a book, um, he published books on like medicine and farming and he um, improved the printing press. Um, some would argue that like Koreans should be credited with like the printing press, <laughs> not Gutenberg. Um, he like, did he, he figured out different ways to write music, tune instruments. He made a rain gauge, a sundial. I mean, the guy was just like, <laughs> wow. like all these things, you know, and once again, like maybe Sejong wasn't in there in his little study, like, hey, how about this idea, you know, and then he's like doing it himself. Like he, he actually had like, um, they called it the hall of worthies. And it's basically, he got like this think tank together and he had, he would bring in these people who showed a lot of um, aptitude um, for learning and just like, like innovation and stuff. And the other interesting thing was like, you didn't have to necessarily be a person from like government um, classes and things like that. Like you, just anyone could actually uh, be in this group if they had the, you know, if they passed the test or something. So really um, yeah, so that was pretty interesting. So he was, but he was also really forward thinking on um, social issues. Like he basically had like a, instituted a maternity leave for like government servants. And like, I read this passage where he said, um, like he established uh, that when a woman had a baby, then they should have a hundred days of like leave. Like basically they didn't have to work for a hundred days. Yeah. And then he noted that, well, sometimes you know, like, I guess the date would be like, well, here's your due date. And then you have a hundred days after that. It's like, well, sometimes the baby, you know, might come early. And so, you know, we, we throw off the schedule. So let's give them a month before they're supposed to have the baby. And then the hundred days after, <laughs> I, I know, right? Like it's 15th century. <laughs> yeah. He was, a, he was very ahead of his time. Still, still comparatively to some, some policies today. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, you know, and then there are stories of like during periods of drought, he would make sure that um, he would he would work to like make have food distributed to people so that they weren't starving. Um, he changed the laws so that uh, like as far as like criminals, if you were like if you were convicted of something, if you were under fifteen or over seventy, you couldn't be put in prison because he thought like that was inhumane, basically. Um, and then there's this one story, like he was just super, just like he didn't have this attitude of like, I'm the king and like every like he, everybody has to be on there, like perfect behavior around me and everything. And so there's this story where like a group of, um, I don't know, like some somehow like from his like King Sejong's like circle, uh, they went hunting. And there was this wild boar and they shot the boar full of arrows and the, and the boar like charged this one person who I guess was on the king's horse and it killed the horse. Okay. And so then it was like, oh my God, the king's horse has been killed. And so they go to the king and they say, well, it's negligence that because these people, you know, these, you know, people who were in charge because of them, this, your horse has been killed and they should be punished. And he was like, I'm gonna read the passage because it's so funny. And so his response was, it happened quite unexpectedly. How could they have known that a large boar would run into this particular horse? Do not speak of this again. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very pragmatic guy. I, I like that, you know, things yeah, happen. Exactly. Accept it, move on. I like it. <laughs> it's like, that's really not their fault, you know, and there are other stories like that about him. I, yeah, I'm definitely that. not. Do uh, not speak typical... of this again. <laughs> Definitely not a typical what you think of king behavior <laughs> through history. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah and that's, that's what I love cool. about, you know, uh, this book and a lot of the other, you know, nonfiction kind of biographies that we publish 
is you get to learn about these really cool people in history that you might know a little bit about, but it kind of mm-hmm. opens up that rabbit hole to like yes. start researching more and then find out more. And, you know, there's been so many, I've told a lot of librarians and teachers, there's been books that like we published that I didn't know certain people. And then I read about it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this person's so amazing. And mm-hmm. I end up learning so much, even though it's kids books, like, you know, I still end up oh. so many things. Yeah. Since Absolutely. I've been working at Albert Whitman, so many cool figures throughout history that we've put out that I've never heard of somebody. And then I learned the incredible story that they've done something truly amazing. And, and I think this is totally a testament to that. Like like you said, a lot of people don't outside of Korea don't know about King Sejong and he did such incredible things. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And yeah, I can't tell you how many things I've learned from reading children's books. Like it's it's such a great way to you know, it's pretty, like, you can get, like, the essential facts really quick, and, you know, they're, most of them are beautifully written, and, yeah. Great art. (laughs) Speaking of great art, uh, since you have your book with you, since you just got it, since it just came out, uh, would you like to share maybe your favorite spread or page from your book? Um, I can do that. Uh, Let's see, I have. It's always exciting when you, when you just get it fresh out of the box. (laughs) I know, it is. Okay, so here, all right, so then here is, this is when he, this one is like coronation. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but what I also love, and then here's like, you know, the, the regular people doing mm-hmm. regular people things. And um, I love the, the quote that, um, when the heavens nourish the earth, he wrote, they do not distinguish between the great and the small. When a king loves his people, it should be the same. Yes, King. Yes. And then, of course. And I love this, also that it shows all the kind of different things that they're doing as well in the art. It's yeah. Like, it's like one task. It's showing different things. Exactly. And then here, of course, is after Hangul. And then I love this image here with children. Everybody of course, reading. children reading. And then, you know, children could read books as many times as they wanted. I think that's my favorite page too. I love that one. It's just so sweet with everybody reading. I agree. So those are, if I had to pick some. I know. It's hard to pick, but. I I picked two. (laughs) It's hard to pick. I know it's like picking a favorite child situation for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Exactly. Now, you know, we talked about the book and everything. What do you hope that readers take away from your book? Like the main, if you had to be like one main thing, what do you hope they take away? Well, you know, there can't be just one main thing, can there, Lisa? <laughs> well, hopefully they take away many things, but if they had to encapsulate their main main takeaway point from King St. John of Vincent Alphabet, what would well, you hope it be? <laughs> you know, like for, like, kind of like the, um, the top level takeaway, especially for the kids, is just to, um, to be presented with this um, idea that access to education and to learning and to reading is really something that we take for granted. And it's a privilege for us. And actually like, it's great that we take it for granted because you know, it's just, it's available to, you know, it's supposed to be available to everyone. It generally is. Um, and that um, it's just something that, uh, that we benefit so much from and um, we, we kind of need to appreciate that because also, of course, there are many people across the globe who still do not have you know, this, this um, disadvantage, these privileges. Um, but uh, there's also um, the broader theme, which I just, you know, I have to bring up the broader theme of the fact that Sejong, King Sejong was this guy who, understood that the entire like his country like he I think his attitude towards like lifting up everyone was because like I sort of feel like he was the, this kind of person who didn't have a scarcity mindset he sort of understood that if we like those of us in a position of privilege should also be trying to raise up those who need help and then everyone benefits instead of being like we need to hold on to our power and to protect it um, and that's how like we benefit, but actually when you when you introduce it to everyone and when you make it available to everyone, then everyone does benefit. Even those people, you know, in power, like they can still benefit also. 
And um, I, I think that his, uh, he understood that the, it's like he understood that the path to Korea's future prosperity even was based on this notion. And I think that um, the fact that, you know, so Korea is this country, it's this little tiny country, it's there hanging on the edge of China and lots of other powers tried to take it and have, you know, taken it over over the centuries. And of course, you know, the last being Japan occupying Korea for many decades. And then the Korean War came, which was devastating to the country. It, was, it just like decimated the country. And yet here, this little tiny country, um, they basically emerged from the rubble of the Korean War. And in a few decades, they have like Korea, like look at Korea now, they are the 10th largest economic, you know, um, country in the world. And highly literate country, of course, you know, when we went to Korea, we went to Seoul, I mean, it's just amazing, like the technology and everything, like Korean people are very, very proud people. Um, and I think because they're like, like we have been through a lot <laughs> and we have survived. And it's because of, you know, I think a lot of, because of their history and everything. But I also really believe that Sejong should be credited for um, instilling this idea in like the culture and Korean culture and also introducing Hangul, which made reading and writing accessible to everyone. The thing about Hangul that is super interesting is that it's very, very simple. And it literally can, like anyone can learn it. it. Like there's a quote, like you can learn it, you know, a really smart person could learn it in like a few hours. And then like, even if you were really dumb, you could learn it in a few days. But so the re like the thing is with Hangul being, like having like the people trying to suppress it many times over the years. But it was like, once Sejong put it out there, there was no turning back because like you didn't need to be like of a certain class to learn it. Like, like anyone, if you like, if maybe somebody in your village knew it and they could teach you. And then, you know, you could teach your kids. And it was like um, was something that people, yeah. And people could still use it, even though it was not, you know, accepted or the official language. And for many years it was kind of, oh, that's the, you know, that's the alphabet for, you know, the peasants or the women and like, it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, yes, you wait. <laughs> and so that's like the other part that I would like, um, just that overall theme of, you know, how, how forward thinking Sejong was and how he is shown as this great example of how um, important it was to be making this, making everyone's lives better and making this really important piece of like education or reading and writing available to everyone. Like, I think like a lot of people would say that that is one of the reasons why Korea like has survived and, and prospered as well as it has. Oh, yeah, this yeah. lesson that, you know, accessibility and inclusivity, like, can really make people flourish when you give them those tools. Exactly. Definitely. So, yeah, so I can't do the, the one thing. But. <laughs> Understandable. Now, uh, I do have to ask, because you did mention going to Korea. Uh, was there one, like you said, you, you kind of saw some stuff at King Sejong when you were there. Was there anything really memorable or your favorite thing when you visited um, that's stuck in your mind about King Sejong or just about Korea in general that might be interesting to our readers or both because it is it is like you said you know I feel like uh, right now you know Korean entertainment and culture has become a huge thing across the globe which is awesome and it's really cool with k-pop and a lot of like k-dramas and things like that so a lot of people in the western world are getting exposed to Korea but was there anything really memorable from your trip there that, that you'd like to share? Um there's a lot of things that really jump out. Um, the one thing is how obvious it is that King Sejong is so much revered because you go it's in Seoul and then there's this like gigantic <laughs> statue of him um, just sitting there like in the middle, you know, like the freeways and everything you're driving around, like you're just like, there's King Sejong. And like, it's kind of like on one end is Sejong and then the other, other end is Admiral Yi, who is another, like the other like really famous person from Korean history because he defended um, Korea from invaders 
um, I don't even remember exactly what time period he's from. Um, but like the other thing is just so interesting how like um, the, the restored palace, Yongbokong palace from Bing Sejong's lifetime is also just stuck right there in the middle of, of the city. It's like, there you are, there, there's, there's, you're just walking along and there it is behind the other wall and there. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, because it's, of course it's centuries old yeah. and it's not, you know, the, the palace of course got destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed, you know, many times. Um, but I, I just found that to be, I don't know, it just was so, it was, it's interesting because, you know, our history in the U.S. is so young. Yep. And then you go to these countries with these ancient histories and it's kind of like, so all this stuff just built up around, like there was the palace. So we'll just start building around the palace. And, you know, this, this giant metropolis just grew up around it. Yeah. Um, I always tell people it's, it's, you know, if you can travel outside the U.S. because like it truly is incredible to go somewhere and, and be in a place that's been around so much longer than even our countries existed to be able to to you know do that or you know when I visited friends even in Europe they were living in places like apartment buildings that were like predated almost like the U.S. being existing yeah. it was such a cool thing to like see that that's just part of everyday life like you said like it's yeah. very kind of cultural thing that we don't really get to experience here so yeah it feels different it feels different because there's so much history just everywhere around you um, and another thing about Korea that was fascinating. So I don't speak Korean. Um, of course, none of my family, my husband's Caucasian. <laughs> so of course he doesn't. Um, and my, you know, me and my siblings don't. My, my brother's wife, um, she is, she came to the U.S. when she was a kid. So she does speak Korean. And of course my dad, but like, so there were nine of us on this trip. And basically my sister-in-law was the only, she was our translator, like nobody else <laughs> Good, good stuff. I mean, I'm so grateful to her for um, like that trip she made. She worked so hard on that trip. And um, but um, the other thing though is that what was interesting though is if you don't speak Korean, like they make it so easy for you. So many people speak English also, but also like they make it, they're really like super friendly to visitors. And like if you get in a cab, for example, and you know, cab driver probably isn't going to speak English, you can like you're supposed to say this phrase. I don't remember what it was, but it's like basically um, like language help or something. And then and then what would happen? And maybe it may even be different now. It probably you just get out your phone and get the app and say like you know translate for me. And they'll and they <laughs> so then they'll like do this. They make it super easy for you so that you can communicate with your cab driver. So you like actually end up <laughs> where you think that yeah. you know you're trying to go. Like oh no no we're in the complete opposite end of town. <laughs> yeah, I always tell people like you know I I've had some people I know that are a little bit hesitant to to go overseas because they don't speak a language when they want to go somewhere and you know, that's the beautiful thing about technology, especially like, and like you said, in certain countries where they're really excited to meet, you know, people from overseas and are very gracious and, and friendly is like, don't be afraid. Like technology exists. You can, you don't have to speak the same language anymore. And it's, it's great to be able to translate and do that. Or, you know, even traveling before that happened, which I did, like you figure like there, there's enough human conditioning where you can kind of mime your way into things and you can figure <laughs> out it's, it's, it's not, you know, the fear of, of that is not worth staying at home. It's definitely still worthwhile to go out and explore because yeah, people are friendly and welcoming across the world. You you realize that like that's a general human thing. Yeah, yeah. And then it's always so fascinating. You know, there's not there's nothing, there's no learning experience like visiting a, another country. Like really like just by being there. Like, and and you, you just don't even realize um, until you do it. How, yeah, I think like it really, really expands your world. Yeah, expands your world. And it also makes you appreciate your own culture too. When you're, when you immerse yourself in a culture that isn't your own and you realize you get to see the similarities, but also the differences and how vast the world is. That was the first time I went abroad. Like I remember being like, oh, there's so much more to the world than just what I experienced mm -hmm. and how that is such an incredible feeling and, and, you know, a way to, you know, really inspire kids to, to dream and think about the world and think about empathy and how the people experience things. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great way to, to open the door into a different kind of learning. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Carol, thank you so much for chatting with me today about your book. It's 
my pleasure. Yeah, I'm very so happy. Um, if you want to, to hold have... it up again, uh, I yes. can it with everybody. King Sejong mm -hmm. of Vincent Alphabet. It's a, a brand new picture book from Albert Whitman and Company. It is available now, so you can purchase it from your favorite bookstore. Uh, and you can also check out our profile here for other author chats with us. Carol, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Right, have pleasure. a happy reading, everybody.